you're okay. Stay right there. Stay right there. Stay right there. No, stay there. Stay there. No, stay there. Just, just stay there. Okay. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> yes, we can start. It's three o'clock. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noru Jawara. Welcome to the second week of Regis 2022. Today, we have the great pleasure of listening to Professor Waller. Dr. Waller is a professor in biology at Old Dominion University. She is specialized in insect ecology, termite biology, ant biology, animal, animal behavior, and animal plant interactions. She has written numerous, numerous papers, proceeding articles, and at least five chapter books that I can recall. She is a member of the ed editorial board of the Journal of Insect Behavior. She received many awards the You Made a Difference Award from Academic Affairs, the Distinguished Teaching Awards from the College of Science, the Partnership Awards from Nature Conservancy. She has a, a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion. She has led many actions for equal opportunities for all at Old Dominion University. She is a recipient of many contracts, grants, and sponsored research. One that is particularly fitting is the Travel Award to Iguazu Falls in Brazil. Please check it out. The online pictures are just phenomenal. What is famous about Iguazu Falls, they are considered as the most amazing, beautiful waterfalls in the world tumbling over the cliffs from the borders with the Argentine province of Misiones and Brazilian state of Parana. Please look at it if you want more information To I'd be glad to you know, post it on the chat. Today, she'll talk about ants. Dr. Waller will cover the diversity of ant life stories and their importance in the environment. If you have any questions, please raise your hands. You can also type your questions in the Q&A box and we will be you know, welcoming Dr. Waller. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Noru. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'd like to share my screen and show um, the PowerPoint that I have about ants. And I guess this is it. Okay. So now we want to start from the beginning and hope we will get there. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. And again, as, okay. as Noru said, if you have questions throughout the talk, just raise your hand and Noru will recognize you. And, and I don't want you to get to the end and then forget your question. So if you have a question during the talk, feel free to ask it. Um, I'm very happy to talk to you about ants. They are fascinating. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about their biology, but um, all ants are, have such interesting life history. So we'll um, cover some of this. So um, the biology of ants, uh, we're gonna start talking about that they're eusocial. That means they are truly social. Uh, we'll talk about their caste system. We'll talk about some remarkable ant species, although they're really all remarkable. We'll talk about some symbioses that they have with other animals. And we'll talk about ecosystem services. These are um, jobs that the ants do for the environment. So the environment is really dependent on ants and they do a um, tremendous amount of good in the environment. So here is a, a slide showing um, what it means to be eusocial. So humans are not eusocial. We're social, but we're not eusocial. In order to be eusocial, you have to have three characteristics that ants have. They have reproductive division of labor. So for example, you see the big queen there, 
She's the only one who reproduces. The workers that you see on the screen, they are sterile, sterile workers. They will never reproduce. So there's division of labor. Only the queen is able to reproduce. There's overlap of generations, meaning that the queen lives with her daughters. Now, all of these ants, all of the ants are females. The males are only made once a year, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But they're all females, and so the queen lives with her daughters. And not all insects do that. Of course, a lot of insects lay eggs, and then they go away, and, and they never, you know, they die, and they never see their offspring. And then also, um, siblings rear siblings. So you see the ant workers there. And all the white are the pupae, the immature ants, and this, the workers are rearing their own sisters. The queen stops helping with the workers. All she does is lay eggs, and the workers do all the work to rear the, the siblings. So as you can see, humans only have one of these characteristics. We have overlap of generation. We live with our parents or with our offspring, but usually siblings aren't rearing siblings, and usually there is not only one reproductive um, individual. So they're eusocial. And within an ant colony, they have different castes. So they have different jobs. So we have the reproductives that I just mentioned, the ones that can lay eggs. We also call these alates. So you can see on the screen, there's an ant with wings. They um, use the wings to go on a mating flight. And after the mating flight, and males and females will get together. That's the one time males are around. Um, they will mate. And then the queen will come down and rip off her wings. And then she'll start an ant colony. Well, the males die right away. Um, that's the only purpose that they have in life is to mate with the queen. And um, the queen is the one that lives on. And she can live up to 20 years, depending on the species. She can live for 20 more years. And she's also mated with the male, but she only mates that one time in the, the mating flight. And she stores all the sperm for the rest of her life. So for those ants that live 20 years or more, they store that sperm that long. So the male has died, but his sperm lives on sometimes up to 20 years. So it's one cell living for 20 years so that the female can fertilize her eggs as she passes them through her reproductive tract. So it's um, a really interesting you know, biology for the reproductive. Then we have the workers. The workers are um, only there to take care of the colony. They basically do everything. The queen lays eggs. The workers take the eggs, they feed them, they rear them, they take care of them, they go out and get food, they keep the nest clean, they do everything. And then some ant species, but not all, have soldiers or major workers. And these usually look physically different from the workers, and they usually have very specialized tasks that they do. So we'll talk a little bit about what these major workers do. So again, it depends on the species. Some species don't have major workers. Some have them and they're very specialized. So one job is, as you might expect a soldier, they defend the colony and they will go after other um, competitors or predators and they'll go off and you know, try to bite them or uh, you know, deter them from hurting the colony. There are some that actually explode. So they are filled with the tacky, sticky material and when they see an enemy, they blow up, they blow themselves up, you know, just like a bomb. Um, and they um, get that sticky goo all over the enemy to kind of impede it from hurting the rest of the colony. Um, by the way, some termites do this also. So it's not just ants. It's, it's a really extreme type of self-sacrifice, but that's what they do. In other colonies um, that feed on hard seeds, they use the major workers to open the seeds. They're like nutcrackers. And in some species, the head is so big that they can't lift it up. They can't stand up. They can only lie on their side with this big head. And the workers will bring them a seed and stick it in their mandibles, their mouths. And then they will you know, crush it. And then the workers will be able to um, take the seed away and eat it. They can't eat it unless the major crushes it. So they're basically just living nutcrackers. And that's all they do for the colony. 
Then there were some other colonies where they store nectar. The majors actually store nectar in their abdomen. And then when the colony needs it, then the workers come and ask for the nectar back to have it regurgitated. I'll show you a picture of that. And there are other major workers in other, in other species that the majors plug the entrance to the nest hole. They're like living plugs and they stick their hole in the nest hole and nobody can come in unless that major worker lets it in. So here's, here's a picture of the honeypot ants. And these honeypot ants store nectar. So the workers go out and they'll get nectar from, from flowers or from aphids or from you know, plant exudates. And they'll bring the sugary material back and they'll feed it to these major workers. And the major workers store this in their abdomen. And you can see all those, you know, it looks like grapes. That's just the abdomen of the major worker full of nectar. And then if the colony comes on hard times and they're starving or they need you know, energy, they go up to these major workers and they tap on them and they say, please regurgitate some of that nectar. And then they get the food and that keeps the colony going. So these are just living casts where they um, store nectar. Now these are mainly in the Southwest of the United States and they're um, in deserty areas. So um, Native Americans used to dig these up and they would eat them like grapes because it would be a source of energy, a very sweet, delicious source of energy. And as I said, in some species like Colobopsis, the, the majors serve as living plugs to the nest. So this Colobopsis lives in like hollow stems or hollow twigs and the whole colony is in there and the entrance is one hole to go in. So the major worker sticks its head in the hole and nobody can come in. There are no enemies can come in. Nobody can harm that colony. Now, of course, the workers have to go out to forage. So they go out and forage. And when they want to come back in, they tap on the major worker's head to say, I'm a nest mate, let me in. And there was actually a, um, a famous ant scientist William Morton Wheeler, and he figured out the code. He, he tried with a, a, you know, little pins to tap different codes on that major worker's face to cause it to withdraw and let it um, open up the hole so that the nest mates could come in. So he cracked the code. He, he discovered what the ants are doing with their antennae, knocking on the face, saying, hey, let me in. I got to get back to the nest, and they'll let them in. So they're, they're very specialized in many of these cases. So I'm gonna talk about some remarkable ants, but as I mentioned, all ants are remarkable. If you take the most common household ant and you learn about its biology, you just be amazed. They're incredible, all the things they can do. But um, some of them are even more dramatic and astounding than others. Dr. So these include the leaf cutter ants. Oh, you have a question? Dr. Waller, we have some questions. Is that okay to ask okay, them great. now? Some of them I'm are happy really, to answer. Some of them okay. are very interesting. So one of them says, you know, how come ants are, I should say, a social, so social. He says, the, the, the question says, so social. I want to say a social being yes. when they have little developed brain system. Well, they don't, they don't need, you would be amazed what they can do and the, the decisions they can make and the flexibility they have. So the brain might be small, but mm -hmm. it's very powerful. That's right. Okay. And um, yeah, so, so some bees and some wasps are social and some of them are solitary, but with ants, they're all social, they're all eusocial. So um, they really work together to make the colony successful. So they are both social and social. Well, they, they are you social, meaning truly social. You means true. So they're truly social in a way that humans aren't. They're more social than humans are. <laughs> they okay. function as a unit. And one other question says, how, how does an ant become a queen? Well, um, when they're, um, it, it starts the same as any of the workers, but they feed it the, the larvae extra food and then it develops into a queen. So once a year, they make the queens and, and the males, and they feed them special food, more food than the others. And that causes them to develop into the queen. And become big. 
Yeah, they become they they they're totally different, and then they become reproductive. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank so you. It's all that. under the control, under the control of the workers. Oh yes. Okay. Excellent. So if okay, you have more great. questions, please type them, and we'll try to answer them while we're going. Yes. Any questions? Just let Nauru know. No. Yeah. Thank <laughs> um, you. So I'm just mentioning some of the ants that I'm going to go over. So we've got acacia ants and acacia trees. We've got army ants and weaver ants. And again, many other ants are fascinating. We're just covering some of them. So leaf cutter ants are also called fungus growing ants. And what they do is they cut leaves in order to feed it to a fungus. And these colonies can have um, millions of workers. And this is the case where the queen and male go out on a mating fight. The, the queen gets all the sperm and stores it. The male dies right away, but his sperm lives inside the queen. And then she can fertilize those offspring for the next 20 years. And again, she can have millions of offspring. It's, it's truly amazing over this time. So the colonies are huge and they just keep on going. She just keeps making more of them because she stored all the sperm and can fertilize her own eggs with that stored sperm. Um, so what they do is they um, chew up these leaves and then they, um, they cut it into finer and finer pieces because there's a range of sizes and they keep passing it down to smaller and smaller ants. And they chew it up until it's a little bitty piece of a fragment. And then they stick it into a fungus that grows only in the ant nest. They've been together for 50 million years. The ant does not grow any place except in the ant nest. The ants can't live without the fungus. The fungus can't live without the ants. And in fact, when the alae go on a mating flight to start their own colony, they take a little bite of the fungus and they stick it in their mouths. And then they go on the mating flight. They come down. Um, they rip off their wings. They dig a hole and they start the new colony. And they've got this little piece of fungus, a starter fungus. They spit it out. And then they take care of it. They defecate on it and they, they nourish it until it starts to grow. And then when they lay eggs and the workers appear, then the workers take over caring for the fungus and the queen just lays eggs. So it, it's really an amazing um, life history. I, I did my dissertation on these ants. Um, they fascinated me back then. They still fascinate me. They're just, there's so much to learn about them. Then we have another interesting ant species, and these are called acacia ants. And they live with a special acacia tree that takes care of the ants, and the ants take care of the acacia tree. So if you can see the, um, the leaflets, you see those little swellings on the end? Those are called beltium body, and they are um, very fat-rich, very nutrient-rich, and the, the plant makes it ants to eat. So that's what the ants eat. And the ants stay on the plant. They live in specialized thorns that the, the tree produces. And when they're hungry, they come out and they chew off these belgian bodies that the plant makes for the ants. So what do the ants do for the plant? They totally keep any, anything from hurting it. So if an insect lands on the tree, the ants go after it and they kill it. They won't let anything eat their, the leaves on that tree. If vines try to grow on the tree, they cut them up and, and drop them off. They clear the base of the tree. They clear all the vegetation away. So it, there's no competition from plants. There's no um, injury from insect pests. The plant is totally protected by the ant. And um, they're, you know, it's just a, an amazing association where, um, again, they're totally independent on each other. I was in, um, University of Texas, where they kept one of these trees with the ant colony on it. And I saw it, and they just put a thread on one of the leaves, and the thread would look like a vine. And the ant came up and it picked up that thread and it dropped it off the tree. It's not going to let anything touch its tree. So they're, they're truly amazing. And if you get near one of these trees, they're going to sting you to pieces. So, you know, stay away from them. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Then we have army ants. Now, most people have heard about army ants. They go in swarms and they just scour the earth and they um, eat everything in their sight. So usually big things can hop away, you know, mammals and, and 
other animals can, you know, hop away and not be hurt. A lot of insects can't get away. So they're just out there grabbing everything, eating it, tearing it to pieces. And then um, they will stop and they'll make their own nest. They don't dig a nest in the ground. They make their own nest. So the workers form what's called a bivouac and they um, hang from each other. So they have very long legs with hooks on the end and they hang from each other and they form a big shelter. And inside this bivouac is the queen and the larvae. And so they, they develop the larvae in there. And then when they're ready to forage again, then they unhook and they go out foraging and um, eat everything in their sight. So I, I worked in Mexico for a while in Veracruz, Mexico, and I lived at, at a field station. And every now and then the army ants would come through. So they would like enter the field station and we would just like climb on a table or climb on a chair and watch them. And they would just go through the field station and they'd kill every insect there was. And we actually enjoyed it because they didn't stay very long, just a couple hours, but they would eat everything in sight. So we didn't have to use insecticides or anything. We didn't want to. The ants took care of it for us. Are those flying ants or just ants without wings? Well, these are the workers. These are all workers. Do they have flying wings? Well, the um, the queens um, actually don't. They it's a special case where the males do, and the, and the queens don't. Um, and they are just carried along by the by the workers. But they're a different cast. The the queens are much bigger, and they're um, in there again laying eggs, and they're they're taken care of by the ants, by the worker ants. Yeah, amazing. And there are some soldiers. We don't see them there, but they also have soldiers. So they're um they're a fascinating ant. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Or... Okay, so that's army ants. Then we have weaver ants. So these these ants are from Asia, and they actually use their own larvae to sew leaves together to make. Them so what they do is the workers will hold the leaves together and they'll often you know, just stretch out and hold one leaf here and one leaf here and they'll hold it together. And then another ant will pick up one of the larvae, immatures, because the larvae can spin silk. That's how they would make a cocoon. But instead, they use them like a shuttlecock and they, they spin silk between the leaves and then the workers hold on to it while it's drying. And as it dries, it's the silk starts to shrink and it pulls the leaves closer together. And so you can see all that silk um, holding those leaves together. That's already been created by the ants. And the ants are living inside. So it's a protection. They make their own out of the leaves. And um, for centuries, the Chinese would use these as pest control in orangeries. So they would cut down one of these nests and they get a different tree, stick it in there. And the ants will not kill all the insects because that's what they eat you know, for food. And then they uh, pick it up and move it to another tree. So they've been used as pest control forever, much better than spraying insecticides. Let the ants bore you. So um, those are some remarkable ants, but as I said, each ant species has its own story and they're all amazing. But some of the symbioses, the relationship that ants have with other animals, um, you know, we, we talked already about the fungus symbiosis and the ant acacia, that's a plant symbiosis with the ants. But here we're gonna talk about some of the animals that the ants take care of. So um, one example is aphids and tree hoppers. Another is uh, caterpillars of the blue butterfly. And then also ants are used by birds to remove their ectoparasite. So we'll go over that a little bit. So here are um, ants tending aphids. And they do this because the ants secrete sugar out of their rear end. And that's because the, I mean, the aphids need to get some nitrogen. There's not much nitrogen in plant sap but there's a whole lot of sugar. So they have to drink huge amounts of plant sap in order to get the amount of nitrogen that they need. And so then they have to excrete the rest of that sugary sap and it's called honeydew. And the, um, the ants use this as a food source. Now the aphids, if they just um, 
pep it all inside, they would just blow up because they take so much sap in. They have to get rid of the sugary material so they can get enough nitrogen. But the ants are happy to take it from them. So they will often go to these um, aphids and drink the sugary solution coming out of them. They will protect the aphids. They will keep parasites from coming after them. They will keep predators from coming after them because they're, they're like their own cows. You know, they basically milk the cows and then feed um, on the sugary solution. So as I said, it's, a, it's not just aphids. There are any of these plant um, sap drinking insects often secrete this sugary material, ants will find them and will take care of them. Do you have so, a question? Yeah, uh -huh. there's somebody asked a very interesting question. He or she said when ants used to fall in his or her milk, her, his or her mom used to say, it doesn't matter, you can just drink it. It will develop your vision. Is there any truth to that? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I would, I would not, I would not drink anything that um, ants produce. You know, so I, you know. No, but if they fall in the milk, would you still drink? Oh, if they the fall milk? in the milk. Oh, I see. Are you well? Yes, actually, ants are extremely clean. Ants produce oh. many antibiotics, cover their bodies in antibiotics. Um, I have no problem with with ants being in my food because they're cleaner than I am. <laughs> they are constantly green, grooming. They're secreting antibiotics and keeping bacteria away from their bodies. So ants are actually very, you know, very clean. So if they but fall you in your milk, it before eating. Yeah, just take it out and let it run away, yeah, and then okay. you can drink your milk. <laughs> okay. It, yeah. Exactly. Although, um, yeah, I mean, ants will go in your food. That's for sure. So they, they right. do fall in things like that. Mm. Um, yeah. Don't, don't worry about ants. Um, in terms of any disease or anything like that. They are just so clean. Mm, excellent, yeah, very good question. It was, that was Thank you for the answer to me. Sure. Okay, so, uh, so we said that the, the ants will get sugars from these aphids and tree hoppers, but they also get sugary materials plus nitrogen from the caterpillars of the blue butterfly. These are little blue butterflies. That's why they're called the blue butterfly. And then on the right is their caterpillar. And this caterpillar secretes sugars and nitrogen in order to have the ants come lick it off. And then the ants will protect those caterpillars. And um, the, you know, the caterpillars, it turns out, actually call the ants to them. So this was discovered recently by a colleague of mine who saw, you know, wherever these caterpillars were, suddenly ants were able to find them. So he suspected that the, the caterpillars were making a sound that the ants could hear. And they are, they're making an, an ultrasonic sound that we can't hear with our ears, but if you use special equipment, you can hear it. It's like ee, 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 and the ants can hear it. And so they hear, oh, that must be a caterpillar um, of the blue butterfly. They will go find it based on what they hear. And then they will lick the caterpillar and protect it and keep any parasites with any predators from getting to it. So I, I don't know if you know, but many caterpillars um, are killed by parasites and predators. Something like 99% of them are parasitized. It's very common for them to be killed. And so they need a protection. They need bodyguards. And so they actually call these ants to come protect them. Now, what you're looking at here, this is the Carner blue butterfly, which is actually an endangered species in the United States. And many different ants will come to these caterpillars. They will hear the squeak, they will come, and many different ant species will come. But um, in the old world, there is often a, a unique association between one blue butterfly species and one, cater and one um, ant species. And the ants take total care of those caterpillars. So they will, um, you know, they'll tend them, you know, lick them, keep them clean. At night, they will take the caterpillars down in their nest so that they're safe during the night. In the morning, they will take them up to a tree so that they can feed. And so they're, they're totally watching out for these caterpillars. And the caterpillars are, you know, very dependent on the ants. The ants are totally dependent on the caterpillars. And it's a, a really unique association.
And then, as I mentioned, um, birds actually have a symbiosis with ants. They do something called panting. And they allow ants to get into their feathers and the ants will release forming acid and that will um, kill some lice that get on birds. It will also kill bacteria, feather degrading bacteria that can hurt the bird's feather. So um, there are two ways that birds ant. One is what you're seeing here. These are some crows on an ant mound. So crows, turkeys, um, other big birds like that will find an ant mound and then they'll flop around on it, let the ants crawl all over them and then release the formic acid and get rid of the ectoparasites. But they're also songbirds. We'll um, find ant colonies or just find the ants out foraging. They will pick them up and they will stick them in their feathers so that they have the same effect. So one is called passive anting, like what you're seeing here. The other is called active anting, where they actively go out and find the ants. So this is actually pretty common. A lot of people don't realize what they're seeing. They'll just say, oh, that, that bird is eating ants. They don't realize that the bird is actually sticking the ants in its feathers. I had a graduate student who did her dissertation on this. And she would take, we wanted to find out which ants were preferred by the birds. So she worked at an aviary um, in a museum. And she would take different ant species there on trays, put them down in the aviary. And the birds, all kinds of songbirds, would come and pick up the ants and, and start sticking them in their feathers and, um, you know, using them to ant. So um, it seems to have some kind of trance-like effect on the birds. So many birds will, like, stick the ants in them, and then they go into, like, a trance. They almost swoon. And some of them will actually fall over. They're just, like, in a, a state of ecstasy or something. I don't know whether it feels good or what, but... Um, it's, it's incredibly fascinating. So anytime you see a bird, you know, looking like it's doing something, pay close attention because it, it might be antsy. Um, then finally, I want to talk about um, ecosystem services. So these are jobs that ants do that help the environment. And they're really critical. There are so many ants, species, they're all doing so different things. So, um, you know, really is and what is a and the Doctor, yes, the beginning of this slide, your, your the sound was gone. Okay, yeah, I, yes. my my yeah. my thing said unstable. So, but um, but yeah. you can hear me now. Now we can hear. You. Yeah. I turned glad. off our camera so that the audio would come through better. Excellent, and now we can okay. start in the beginning of this slide. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so these, these are um, services that the ants provide to the environment that allow the environment to do better. Now, did I lose you? I now I can hear you. Okay, okay, good. So um, one thing they do is they help the soil. They enhance the soil with their nests and their tunnels underground. That opens up passageways into the soil and... Air can get in there, so it's, it's oxygenating the soil and oxygenating the roots that are down there. It also allows water to get in. So instead of the water washing off, you know, we have the big rain and the water just washes off and doesn't get into the soil. Well, the ant tunnels allow the water to get deep into the soil and help, you know, water the soil. And then also ants are going way down deep and bringing up nutrients from the depths. So a lot of plant roots only go so deep and they can't reach all those nutrients. Well, the ants bring those nutrients back up to the surface so plants can use them. So um, they really make the soil much more fertile and richer and, and better for plant growth. Another thing ants do is disperse seeds. And many seeds are adapted to have ants move them away from the plant. So, you know, obviously plants don't want to drop their seeds right 
right next to the adult plant because then they'd be competing with each other. So they want to get the seeds far away from them. And many of them use ants to do that. So they produce something called an eliazone, which is a, a fatty, nutrient-rich um, projection off the seed that is attractive to ants. The ants will carry it off chew it off in the nest, discard the seed, which then is in a great environment to, to develop. I'll, I'll show some slides to go with all this. Ants also eat plant pests, as we saw with the acacia ants. So many plants produce extra floral nectar. So these are nectar sources, not in flowers, but on the stem or on the leaf that are attractive uh -huh. to ants. And the ants um, go around looking for these extra floral nectaries to drink the sugar. But if they run into a, a pest, an ant pest, they're gonna eat that too. So the, the plants produce these extra floral nectaries to attract ants. So the ants will patrol the plant and keep it um, safe. And of course, ants are very important in the food chain. So there are many species of insects and other arthropods that eat ants. Many birds eat ants, many mammals eat ants, many reptiles eat ants, and many amphibians eat ants. So they're essential to the food chain. So let me show you some pictures of that. So here's an ant nest, you know, in cross section, showing how it can aerate the soil. You can see how the tunnels go down, and that allows air to get down there in the soil. That allows water to get down there in the soil. And also the ants are bringing the soil back up. So all those nutrients that would be lost to the plants are now available to the plants. So they're, they're helping soil fertility. Here is a seed with an eliasome on it. And it's that, um, that white structure. It's fatty rich. The ants are very attracted to it. When they find these seeds, they will take them back to their nest. They'll chew off the eliasome. They'll eat it. And then they'll just throw the seed away. But of course, the seed now is in an ant nest which is a very safe, rich environment. And so um, it can germinate and, and thrive inside the ant nest as a plant. Now, uh, there's a interesting situation, kind of a scary situation in South Africa, which is one of the most floristically diverse, faunistically diverse, many exotic species of plants and animals live in South Africa, but it's a habitat that burns frequently. So a lot of plants cannot afford to just drop their seeds on the ground because they would burn up when these burns happen. So what they do is they have these eliasomes on the seeds so that the ants will take them deep into the ant nest so that when a fire races through the area, the seed is safe, it's underground, it's in the ant nest, it's not going to be hurt. And so many South African plants depend on ants to keep their seeds safe from these fires. However, an invasive ant, an ant called the Argentine ant, has invaded the area. It's outcompeting the native ant species. The Argentine ant does not disperse seeds. It's not interested in these seeds. So it just leaves them on the surface of the ground. It allows them to burn up. And so people are worried that many plant species might go extinct because this new invasive ant is stopping seed dispersal by ants. So we hope, we hope that won't happen, but it is a, it is a worry. So one question. Sure. The, the ants, I want to say compete with each other. Yes. yes. Okay. There's a competition there. Oh, very strong. Ants are the most competitive organism they have territories around their nests. Anybody comes into their territory, they're going to, you know, get rid of them. They're, um, they're extremely competitive with each other, whether they're the same species or a different species. They are just very territorial. Mm -hmm. okay, they don't like competitors. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, ants will produce extra, or plants will produce extra floral nectar. So this is a bean plant, and it will produce little areas on the leaves and on the stem that produce nectar so that the ants will search for it, drink the nectar, and then they will also patrol the plant. And then if they run into an insect, like an insect pest, then they'll kill it. 
So again, they're the bodyguards for the plant and the plants are spending energy, you know, cost energy to make these extra coral nectaries. But um, it's worth it to them because the ants keep them from being eaten by insect pests. So many, many plants have these extra coral nectaries and ants are constantly checking out plants, looking for them and eating any insects that are there that according to the plant shouldn't be there. And then, as I said, many, many organisms eat ants, you know, birds, reptiles, mammals, um, other arthropods, amphibians, you know, and a huge for many organisms. And one of the most um, interesting to me anyway, this is the, um, the desert horned lizard. Now, I grew up in California where we had these and we called them horny toads, but they were not toads, they're lizards. Um, but they eat ants and what they eat, they eat harder ants, which have an incredibly sting. And I know because I have been stung by them. So I've been stung by them. It almost knocks you out. And then you have this incredible pain around your body. Um, but these, these, that's basically all these desert horn lizards eat. They can eat them. They're not affected at all by the sting. So they're adapted to tolerate that sting and, and eat these ants. So it's just one species that's dependent on ants, but many, many species are dependent on ants for food. So um, I, I thank you for listening. I'm happy to entertain any questions. And a lot of these images came from a source called Creative Commons, which has a lot of public domain images and also some that you credit the creator. But um, I, I thank them for the images. It's, um, a great asset to be able to find. Thank you so much. This is oh, exciting okay. talk. You know, this is very exciting and lots of, you know, great information. So here's one question that came okay. in. How come ants have such a bad reputations, especially with homes and termites? Well, you know, people, people just don't think about them the right way. It's the same, like you say, with termites. People don't like termites because they get into their, the wood in their houses. People don't like ants because they get into the food in their houses. But you can find ways to keep ants out. And in fact, that's what we're doing in the Rages Project. Um, we're looking at spices that can keep ants out of your house because they're very important in the environment. We want them to stay out there, do their job. We don't want to kill all ants. We certainly don't want to spread you know, pesticides all over the place where um, we could easily keep them out with spices. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, let me, it says you asked me to start my video. So let me see if I can so, get back. Okay. So there's lots of research as to how to, you know, move ants from one location to, a, to another one that is safer for us, for humans. Well, you, just to keep them out of the house, basically, because it's good to have them around the house. They're good for your plants. They're good for everything. Um, you just don't want them in your house because people don't, I don't actually don't mind them that much, <laughs> but people don't like them. And, and as I said, they're very clean. So if you have ants in your house, don't worry about them. They're not spreading germs. They are the cleanest, you know, clean as clean can be. They, they, they get rid of any bacteria, anything that's on their bodies. Sometimes our pets don't like those ants too. Is it? Yeah, no, pets don't like them either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, some sometimes I like to play with them, but you know. right, right. <laughs> and he, mm -hmm. right. Go ahead. Here's one question. Sure. He says, if the queen can't produce produce more eggs, do they get disregarded like the bees? Well, yeah, the, the queen can only produce as many eggs as her lifespan will allow. Okay. So then, typically, she'll die, and then then the colony will usually die because they, you know, they themselves are sterile workers and can't produce eggs themselves. So each, each colony, um, each species has its own lifespan. Like I said, the leaf cutter ants can live for 20 years. Some ants only live a couple of years. It just depends. It depends, yes. Uh -huh. Right. So one person says, you know, I don't mind coming to a home, to my home, but the thing they carry annoys me. What do the they do? They don't, they don't all sting. Only a few ant species actually sting. 
Unfortunately, mm-hmm. those are the ones we know. For example, fire ants have moved into my area in Norfolk, Virginia, and mm-hmm. um, they, they showed up in 1989 and now they're well established and they're terrible. If you've ever, has anybody, have you ever been stung by a fire ant? Try not to be. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are incredibly painful. So you, you know, some ants sting and they're just so painful, but most ants don't. Um, most ants are, you know, they be you out because they're probably, but um, they're, most of them can't hurt you. Like carpenter ants, you know, those big ants that you might right. find around trees. Yes. Mm-hmm. They don't, they can't hurt you. In fact, they're big chickens, they'll run away. You know, they're, they can't hurt you. They can't sting, they can't hurt you at all. Just depends on the ant. But you, if you don't know which ants can sting, you don't want to mess with any of them just in case. So. That's right. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> right, yeah. mm-hmm. right. So don't be afraid of the ants. Just do a little research before getting rid of them. Right, right. And, and one thing we found is that um, tends to plants. So my students this year are, are testing it again. But in general, cinnamon, ants mm-hmm. don't like cinnamon. And I don't mind smelling cinnamon. I love it. So um, I often put it like around my windowsill and places like that because the ants don't want to go near it. I don't That's know right. why. Cinnamon, yes. There's yes, another cinnamon. one too, the chalk. You know, the old-fashioned chalk board. Oh, Whenever no, I throw it somewhere, the ant won't cross it. What is okay. the reason? Now, see, I never heard that. That, that would be interesting to test, so... Right, the old yeah. chalkboard, you know, these huh. are different colors. Uh huh. I draw. Okay, I wonder it, what's in there. That I don't know what's in it, yeah. but usually, when I once I draw it on the floor or somewhere, it usually uh-huh. you know, gives them a signal not to cross it and find an alternate route. Oh, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try that. <laughs> so yeah. all these things are inexpensive too. So mm-hmm. it's You're nice right. to have cheap things that you can use as opposed to going out and buying you know, fancy, expensive insecticides. That's why there isn't that much research on it because the companies that make the insecticides, they can't make money if you can just use your household spices or chalk to get rid of the ant. So. Right, right, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, now, here is one question that is still being burning and I think it came out earlier. Which one do you think are most dangerous, the flying ants or the regular ants? Well, I personally don't think they're dangerous. Now, the flying ants usually are not going to sting you. The flying ants, they just want to mate. As soon as the female is mated, she wants to dig a hole and start a colony away from you. But it's the workers. If if it's a species that does sting, it's the workers that are going to go after you because, or and some of the soldiers because they want to um, keep you away from them. Okay. But the ALH usually they won't bother you. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's exciting. Any more questions? Anyone else has questions or comments? Yeah, mm-hmm. happy to answer anything. So right, right. now I see yeah. chat. I don't know. Uh-huh. Oops, I don't know. I one, the, 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 the talk started by some when someone so when someone wrote ants are cute. So they I are cute. You would agree with that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope everybody thing- Mm-hmm. The only thing I disagree is there was a movie, I think it had Woody Allen in it or something like that, where um, they had ants. That was totally phony because they had boy ants. You know, like I said, the boy ants are only there once a year. Mm-hmm. And they also um, you know, were holding things in their feet. You know, it was it was not realistic. They were cute, but they weren't real. <laughs> right, right. They were cartoons. That's right. They were cartoons. Yeah. But real yeah. ants, I think, are beautiful. And if you look at them under a microscope, they are beautiful. They're so mm-hmm. complex and so beautiful. So um, right. Right. Yeah. just look uh-huh. closely at them and enjoy them. That's right. Don't get to, but we can feed them also. Yes. We can feed them, you know, close to our plants, close to our homes and so. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, and in fact, that's what we're doing in our project is they're going to be putting out bait to right. draw the ants to it and then put the spice on to test the spice if it keeps them from eating it. So first we want to attract them. Then we want to see if it will repel them if we put a spice on. Mm-hmm. But, um, mm-hmm. but no, they're fun to watch. They're, they're fascinating. There's, um, and not only that, I didn't even talk about some of the, the insects that live with the ants. 
there are some little teeny beetles that follow the ant nest mm -hmm. and, and live inside the ant nest. There's a little cockroach, teeny little cockroach that go that hops on the queen of the mm -hmm. leaf cutter ant when she goes on a mating flight and they fly to the new nest with her. Then they hop off and they start their own family there in the fungus garden. There, there's so many things going on. So is, is there some, is, is there research on the brain activity of, you know, ants? Yes, yeah, there's a lot of research on um, how ants make decisions and then um, how um, neurons are, you know, communicating right. with each other. They, they do have a, a very tiny brain, obviously, <laughs> since ants are small, mm -hmm. but they don't need it. It just shows you that a big brain is not everything. A big brain doesn't, you know, doesn't let you do him. Most of the things that we do as a society, the ants have already done. Again, like, you know, keeping cows and, and cattle. They've been doing that forever. Growing fungus for food, farming for food. They've been doing that forever. Um, hunting. We, you know, we hunt, but they have been hunting forever. They do so many things that we are just catching up with them for. Um, and they didn't, they didn't do it with their brains. They did it with um, collective decisions that they made. They're, they're just, they're amazing. But it looks like they, the smell you mentioned, they leave a trace so that others can pick up on it. Yes, can and then I did mention that. Yeah, but I, I, I don't I think should've humans should've have that talent, or? To leave a, a smell trace? <laughs> or something like say, you know, you do this part and someone else is supposed to come and pick up from it. Uh -huh. How can we well, benefit from the ants? The, the only thing I can think, you know, ants, I forgot to mention, ants do use pheromones. So they lay a trail pheromone mm -hmm. and then um, the other ants know where to go. Right. And right. Um, I also didn't mention, I mean, there are just so many things about them. They can look in the, the pattern, the ones that are um, desert ants, they can look at the celestial pattern of the stars and that's how they navigate. That's how they know where they are. They're, oh, really? they're amazing. But, but people, the only thing I can think of is Hansel and Gretel, where they left little breadcrumbs, remember, to the witch's house? That's right, yes. So, <laughs> so that's all we do. We, and I guess, you know, Native Americans probably leave little, you know, um, signs on trees and things like that so people know where to go. But we don't do it with smell like the ants mm, do. <laughs> yeah, amazing, amazing, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Any other comments? Let me see if I can see a question. Okay. I don't see any, but definitely this has been enlightening. I'm very glad you were able to share some of that knowledge. And uh, here's, well, one here's one question that just okay. popped up. Okay. Why are ants mostly attracted to sugar? Well, because um, sugar is a, a good source of energy. It's very easy to um, get the energy out of sugar. And so um, most most ants will just take sugar because it's, you know, quick energy, essentially. So they need energy, but they also need, you know, protein and fat. So they're also attracted to things with, with fat in it and sometimes protein. But sugar is just quick energy. So they'll always go for that. Okay. Much like us, you know, we always you know, are looking for a sugar source to, you know, for your diet, coke, not your diet, coke, but your, your coke or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. They're very similar to us. Very similar. Okay, but very well organized, so she, you know. Oh, so socially. organized and keeping track of each other. They, mm -hmm. we say that they have a social stomach because they pass food around among the entire colony, so they know everything about everybody else in the colony. They're um, they're an amazing society. Amazing, yeah. and they work together a lot better than we do. I'll tell you that. <laughs> that's that's not our strong point. I don't think. We have some learning to do from ants. We do. Go to the ant and be wise. <laughs> and yeah, and more research too, just like you mentioned, you know, and I Absolutely. hope the students can pick up from here too, in terms of biology. How did you get started in biology in this research? I Well, I've always loved insects, but, um, and when I went to um, graduate school at University of Texas, that's where they had this Texas leafcutter ant. And I, I didn't know what to work on. I was going to work on dogs or something like that. But I went out to this field station and I saw these ants carrying these leaves back to the nest. 
And I just, uh, the more I learned, about, I thought this is the most fascinating thing I've ever heard. And not only that, they've been doing it for 50 million years. That's I mean, we haven't been around hardly any time. And yet the ants have been doing this for 50 million years. It was, I was just overwhelmed. And I, I still am. They're, they're incredible ants. Very, very well organized. Yeah. Oh, so organized. Yes. yes, yes. Efficient. Right, efficient. Mm -hmm. Yes. And able to face nature too, like big rains, drought, all conditions actually. They can deal with it. They they can deal with all of that. They have ways, certain behaviors that kick in when, you know, if it's a dry period, then often they won't go out and forage. If it's, you know, wet, they'll often move. I mean, they, they can just do, make decisions that are really effective. Mm -hmm. And all from learning from each other. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Now, what happens? Do they do mourning of the other ants if one of them passed? Well, they, they often have a burial ground. Now, do you mean do they grieve for each other? Or something, something like that, yes. I know some I, animals I don't do. think so because the colony is really almost like a body, and each individual ant is more like a cell. So you don't feel bad if, um, when you cut your fingernails or something like that yeah. because it's all part of this, the same whole. So... Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't feel they, do. they will put all the dead ones in one place. They'll have like a mortuary pile so that um, in case they have disease or something, that it won't spread to the rest of the ants. Mm -hmm. So they're, uh, they have very special places where they wall off the, um, the dead ones. I don't think they feel bad about it, but I don't know. Maybe they do. <laughs> and why do flying ants, you know, go around lights? How come they are attracted to lights? Well, many, many insects are attracted to lights, and it's probably related to the, um, the moon. So, of course, you know, lights are not natural to them, but the moon is. For example, mm -hmm. I used to follow the mating flights of these leafcutter ants, and we mm -hmm. lived across, the field station was across from a Safeway. So as soon as they had the mating flight at 4 a.m., I would head over to the Safeway, and the ants would be all over there because they had gone. They thought they were following the moon, but instead they went to Safeway. Okay. Um, and that's where I would find them. <laughs> all right. All right. And it's a yeah. shame because we have too many lights in our society and that's hurting insects. We need the lights too. We need, well, yeah. no, Don't just confuse the ants. <laughs> Let's not confuse the ants, yes. Yeah, turn off the lights, go to bed. You don't need them. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Right. Well, thank you again so much. That should do it as the last question. I really want to oh. say, you know, we appreciate your talk and all the information you shared with us. I hope most well, more you of so us moderate. more <laughs> of us will be, you know, into this research, into biology research. Into I hope so. Into ant and animal behavior. Because, you know, again, just like you mentioned, there's so much to learn. Oh, and yes. Any start is good, you know, by observing it, that's a very good start, you know, observing it is a At, good Oh, absolutely. We'll see that nobody has ever seen before. There's so much out there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so this is contributing not only to science, but to our well-being, you know. Absolutely, society, absolutely. Society, so. so again, thank you for coming. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you next. I believe tomorrow we have more talks coming up too. But uh, we want to take again this opportunity to say thank you so much. We are really appreciative of you taking time to speak to us today, Dr. Wallen. And, and, and thank you all. to you and, and to the, the support staff here um, for making it possible. Thank you. Of course, yes. Uh -huh. All right. Until next time, have a good rest of the day. And uh, okay. let's look at ends more closely now. Yes. That's what I'll be doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Take a good look. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Have a good rest of the day and have Okay, thank a, you. Have a you day. too. Thank you again. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Bye bye.